The Brussels Report podcast. Welcome to a new episode of the Brussels Report uh, podcast. Um, my name is um, Peter Kleppe. I'm the editor in chief of uh, Brussels Report.eu. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to have as my guest today um, uh, ECR MEP Charlie Weimer. So he's a, an, a member of Parliament, uh, of European Parliament for the European Conservatives and Reformists, and of course for the, um, the Sweden Democrats in his home country um, of, uh, of Sweden. So welcome, Charlie. Thanks a lot, Peter. So Charlie, maybe I should uh, give a quick introduction. We know each other a long time. Uh, I would consider you as uh, one of the best uh, MEPs uh, from my personal perspective, from the Brussels report um, perspective. You fight for decentralization, uh, free markets, uh, you know, standing up for democracy in, in the world. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, something great. Originally, you, you come from the, um, the Christian Democrats in Sweden, uh, but then uh, you, you for sort of changed party, um, uh, not IDs, I would say. You've always uh, stick to, I would, as far as I know, more or less the same IDs. Um, and uh, now, since 2019, you are, um, I would say, a very influential MEP uh, for for um, ECR and Sweden Democrats, right? Well, thank you for that introduction, Peter. Um, yeah, we, we go back a long time, and uh, uh, one could uh, maybe brand us as reformists uh, in our perspective on what's going on in 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 um, uh, here in Brussels and. Um, Sort of, um, yeah, my, my EU um, interest goes back all the way to 2004 when I attended my first event with the Youth of the European People's Party. And that was in Ukraine. Um, right. And we, um, we were listening to Viktor Yushchenko, if anyone remembers uh, that old presidential candidate who was poisoned by whom? Well, um, you go figure. Um, and then uh, he was elected president and Russia started uh, making problems with gas prices. And that's when I um, <clears throat> realized the importance of energy security uh, uh, some 20, 15, 20 years before the Germans. Um, so um, and then I went on uh, and uh, became vice president of the youth of the EPP and uh, really learned uh, how to argue against uh, EU uh, central, centralism, EU federalism. And it was then that I met you for the first time um, while being here in Brussels and learning about open Europe and all the important work that you were doing at the time. So you have been, your work uh, has been an inspiration for me trying to really uh, make the case for a slimmer, more, um, economy-based uh, European Union that, than uh, what we see today. So um, the fight ain't over. So uh, here I am in the EP now trying to do the, you know, fight the good fight. Very good, very good. And indeed, uh, sort of reform of the EU is always something uh, that I think both of us have been um, campaigning for uh, with a mixed uh, success, or I would say... Uh, with little success in actual policy results, but I'm sure we, uh, we've been able to convince um, at least part of uh, public opinion, uh, and, and that is really important. Uh, uh, now, um, in over the last year, we had this um, conference on the future of Europe, uh, as it was called, and the ECR also conducted a campaign um, to, to, you know, try to... Uh, um, uh, try to make the best out of this, but ultimately um, the ECR uh, decided to basically uh, uh, step up and um, you know and, and walk. Uh, so, so can you uh, explain that uh, decision a little bit and, and maybe um, um, everything that, according to you, is is, is wrong with this whole uh, exercise? Mm -hmm. I mean, within the ECR, there's a historical memory of the whole. Um, a convention, uh, European convention process that took place uh, 20 years ago, headed by Valérie uh, Giscard d'Estaing, who uh, really uh, told the audience, a mix of MPs, MEPs, commission representatives, and so on, that, yeah, you're in consensus in favor of more Europe. 
I deem that this is a consensus. No votes were held. He was basically uh, steering the whole process himself with his, uh, um, with his team. Um, we knew about this. So when they started the whole conference uh, initiative and uh, the centralist groups in the European Parliament sidelined the ECR group, we saw instantly, okay, this is going to be rigged as well. But we decided to um, be a constructive uh, force in this, try to be a constructive force uh, and take part in it. But uh, when it um, turned out that uh, this conference, uh, people like Guy Verhofstadt and others, they were not really interested to, in, in finding out what European citizens actually believe, but rather uh, to um, take these um, views expressed by so-called citizens' panels um, who are who were basically recruited on a huge um, selection bias, uh, where people who were in favor of and interested in the EU were more than happy to take part. Some of them even um, part of the federalist organizations, while people who have a more Eurorealist, Eurosceptic view. They actually said no when the Kantar research uh, approached them. And we have asked uh, for, for um, this selection process to be um, uh, made public. They refused because they know that we will then be able to um, really shatter the impression they want to make that the citizens are speaking out in favor of transnational lists, uh, abolished vetoes, and so on and so forth. This was a very costly uh, conference, um, and um, the only thing it uh, really led to was yet another argument for a treaty change, and that is the next fight that is going to take place where they want to go for basically um, the rest of the vetoes except for fiscal policy because they know that they cannot get there yet. But be so sure they will try to abolish that one too when time is right. Yeah, and, and um, I think you really cut uh, to the heart of it. I mean, um, the, there was a lot of self-selection bias in the process. Uh, yeah. And there perhaps you could still say, well, look, I mean, it's hard to get it right. But then there's no excuse not to, um, not to be financial, financially transparent, right? There's no excuse for that. And then... Um, I remember looking at these expert groups. I mean, literally um, 75% of them were on record um, financially dependent from EU money. And probably the other 20, 25% as well. It was only not obvious from the very start. So, so I mean, I, I did not see a, a single expert that was even remotely um, Eurosceptic or constructively critical to the EU. So, so they, they did it in a... In, like they, they should have done it in a, in a much smarter way, at least have some token Eurosceptic somewhere uh, to, to give it a, a bit of respectability, uh, but, but not even that. So, so um, it's, it's quite worrying, really, right? It's quite telling that they didn't even bother to do that. That says a lot about the, the um, uh, mentality of, of uh, Brussels today that uh, um, no need to pretend anymore after Brexit because mm. there is no major force there to oppose this anymore. Um, and, and you have countries such as Sweden, Denmark, Finland, to a certain extent, Netherlands, the Frugals, they are not as gung-ho as, uh, as Germany and France uh, or more powers to the EU, but they lack the power that London used to have within the European Union. And the Brussels is acutely aware of that. They, they, they know that they can steamroll uh, the Swedish social democratic government because uh, um, these are countries that are afraid of repercussions in case they, they sort of try to withstand this development. Um, so uh, that is what we have today. The conference was um, sort of um, limited by the fact that um, there was no mandate to propose any concrete treaty changes. So what they did was to propose 
potential treaty changes and then demand a new conven- convention. So that's how they get around that. And uh, now you see the in the aftermath, you see Scholz, uh, uh, Kanzler Scholz, he uh, now demands foreign policy veto to be abolished. And um, you have the um, ECB want, wanting to um, make uh, the Corona Fund idea concept a permanent feature. Um, mm-hmm. So you have a lot of movements in the aftermath of this conference. So even though most experts, I mean, outside experts, uh, pundits, uh, deem this conference to be quite a meaningless procedure, um, mm-hmm. the, 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 the aftermath, the, what, what, they, what they can actually do out of it may unfortunately not be meaningless. Um, so this is where we are. And, um, and I think it's high time that uh, these uh, frugal countries uh, establish some sort of permanent cooperation in order to uh, fight this development. And uh, um, also to call on Central and Eastern European countries that are today net recipients but actually um, have within their own countries a, 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 a notion of sovereignty that um, is, is, is uh, uh, a, potential, um, a potential factor in all this, well, call on them to, to actually uh, step out and, and take this more principled discussion as well. I think that is what is needed today. Yeah, absolutely, and and um, of course, in the ECR, you have a bit of a, you know, a coalition between, um, well, the, at least the Sweden, uh, uh, the, the Swe- Swedish Democrats and and um, governing parties in Poland and and the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so perhaps that's a move forward. But I, I personally still find it in, incredible that uh, Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, Sweden, and Denmark that their governments accepted this, um, you know, this transfer fund, this uh, fund that is supposedly linked to the COVID crisis, eh? but mm-hmm. that is also clearly just another, you know, uh, transfer scheme to prop up the euro. And I mean, today it emerged that the ECB and its new instrument, um, you know, uh, where it will selectively buy uh, bonds uh, from eurozone governments, depending on how much debt they have, that they will link this to conditions set in the next generation EU fund. So that's another, um, you know, clear evidence that this is all about the euro. And it's just yeah. puzzling why the Swedish government did not push this harder, right? That they didn't, wouldn't have to pay for eurozone bailouts. They're not part of the euro. No, exactly. And uh, n- now we'll, we have Croatia joining and that will probably even... Um, other the the costs uh, for Sweden in the future to be the, an EU member because uh, the euro has effectively become part of the heart of the EU with the Corona Fund and that's a precedent that uh, Brussels is not going to forget they are going to do this again whenever needed um, and um, what is Sweden going to say then when when it's no longer supposedly about Corona this is a, a it, it, it is flabbergasting that they uh, accepted it. And uh, um, rumor has it that uh, out of these frugals, it was our prime minister who, who broke ranks the first and, oh. and actually accepted um, Jean-Michel's uh, proposal. Um, and that is so telling about the weakness of, of uh, my current government. But in the case of Poland, Hungary, um, it's quite interesting. There's an image in Sweden that these countries are always standing up to power moves by Brussels. But I mean, up until now, when it comes to budgetary issues, they mm-hmm. uh, are voting in a very expansive way uh, because obviously billions of euros have been flowing to these countries. And it's I do understand from a real politique point of view that it's hard for you know, uh, a Polish politician to come home to his or her constituency and tell the voters, no, 
this uh, road is not going to be uh, built because I'm a principled guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do understand that, but um, I think that uh, there needs to be a discussion of where does all this lead. Um, and um, the, the United States of Europe has been, you know, the, the sort of buzzword for trying to explain the, the vision of Brussels. But uh, it's also somewhat imperial. And I think, um, I think that um, the Poles and the Hungarians, they ought to have that discussion. OK, to what extent can we contribute? To, to this development uh, uh, before we, we create circumstances in which it will be impossible to maintain our sovereignty. Uh, I mean, that, that's because um, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe that issue is going to resolve itself by the fact that these countries have quite a high growth rate and um, in the future, not too long a time, a country such as Poland will be a net uh, contributor. So mm. maybe things will change then. But I'd rather see it change uh, before. Yeah. Let's let's move to, um, to another very important topic, uh, migration. Eh? If there's one thing that uh, Europeans really care about is, um, is disorderly migration flows. And, um, you know, the European Union's uh, legal framework play a very important part in this, in, in constraining member states, um, in, in dealing with uh, disorderly migration in all kinds of ways, from family reunification to, to uh, guarding the border. And uh, I would say it's telling that Denmark, which is outside of the EU migration policy really, uh, is now experimenting with mi- mixed success uh, with outsourcing migration policy, uh, with, with basically closing a deal with countries like Rwanda, where people that apply for asylum would have to await their asylum request before mm. they are ent- able to enter the country, <laughs> uh, yeah. which I would say makes perfect sense. You know, back in the days, if you wanted to m- migrate to America, you had to pass uh, through this uh, little island, um, Ellis Island, yeah. Ellis Island uh, where there was an initial check and, and, uh, I mean, you can have a very generous migration policy. That does not mean you should uh, do it in a disorderly manner, right? Uh, so in yeah. itself, this is even um, apart from the discussion, do we accept a lot of immigrants or very few? This is about, uh, you know, um, applying the rules uh, and, and making sure that only people that are welcomed are um, are able to get in. So, so yeah, what's what's your view on that and on, 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 in particular on the, the Swedish EU commissioner, uh, Ilva Johansson, uh, once a communist, maybe still a communist, uh, who is responsible for that. Yeah, definitely a socialist, at least. Um, <laughs> um, well, th- there is a whole lot to say about EU migration policy. Let's start with um, with uh, Denmark. Um, you, you noted that they are outside um, uh, the, the um, EU um the, the EU migration cooperation, and that is uh, uh, that is a fact that makes them free to pursue an independent migration policy. And Dilba Johansson has uh, condemned their Rwanda plan, um, but um, the Danes they can just you know um, they can just ignore her because mm. she cannot drag them to the ECJ. Uh, she can only complain, and uh, this is um, this is very interesting, um, and um, it's a path that I would want Sweden to go as well to to uh, uh, negotiate an uh, exception from uh, from this um, uh, an opt out from from this right. cooperation. Anyway, Denmark has a social democratic government that that should be noted. And they uh, they argue uh, um, basically based on two main points. Um, number one, the Danish welfare model with, will not be possible to uphold with continued mass migration. And so their vision of a society where you know 
with a re reasonable Gini co coefficient um, and uh, with a reasonable uh, societal cohesion and with uh, a secure safety, social safety net and all that, um, they, they, they don't think that that will be possible if, if they walk the same path that Ulva Jumansson wants to walk. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that they they point to the tens of thousands of dead on uh, the Mediterranean since 2014, and mm -hmm. they correctly state that this will end if our uh, model is implemented in the EU. So yes. um, they, they, I mean, uh, and Charlie, I if I might interrupt. That. Uh, they are yeah. right because uh, this has been tested, you know, in Australia, uh, yeah. which implemented a similar policy of outsourcing asylum processing. The, the number of people drowning at sea uh, dropped to near zero when this was implemented. So this is not yes. like some experiment and we don't know where it's going to end. No, w we know that this breaks the model of the smugglers. Indeed. Indeed it does. Um that's outside the coast of Australia went down to zero. Um, so um, indeed it is tested. And uh, the conservatives in the UK, they, they know this too. They have uh, basically copied uh, the Danish plan and they have struck a deal with Rwanda, um, a deal which Rwanda is happy about. And uh, it is to be noted that uh, those who are awaiting a decision on their asylum request uh, in Rwanda, uh, or have been granted asylum and a refuge in Rwanda, they are free to leave that country any day they want. Mm. So we're not talking about internment camps or anything yes. like that. That is a, a, an important point to make. Um, but what the Danes do not talk about as much uh, is um, the um, migration, the coming migration pressure to Europe. I mean, I've been taking a look at this and, and the figures are staggering. I mean, um, I put together um, figures from the French um, Development Aid Agency uh, together with um, uh, polls from Ipsos. And it uh, indicates that uh, around 500 million people would want to immigrate today to the European Union if they had the resources, the opportunity, and so on. So we're talking about the same amount of people as the whole of the EU um, population. Um, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, look at, um, look at the UN's uh, demographic prog prognosis for Africa, where, where the population there will um, go from 1.4 billion today to 4 billion at the end of the century. And um, they are not able to match that with uh, job creation. Uh, the job creation in Africa uh, is, it does only meet the, the population growth of Nigeria alone. And if you look at the willingness to emigrate in these sub-Saharan countries, it's huge. We're talking about sometimes half the population that wants to uh, emigrate. Yeah. So... Uh, Taking this into account, um, the, the, the migration pressure that we've seen so far to Europe is, is paling in comparison to what we will face. And there is no real educated, informed discussion on the EU level about this. It's anytime you raise these uh, points, um, the Liberals, the Greens, uh, the socialists, they shy away and they, they, they accuse um, uh, people like me for black painting and so on and so forth. But these are, these are facts and figures. Uh, so um, th this, is, this is what we need to base our, our future EU migration policy on, I think. Uh, but today, if we go to the situation today, I mean, it's... it's um, Sometimes I joke that, okay, we give millions of euros to clowns without borders, EU money to them, uh, making shows for grown-up Afghans uh, mm. in countries such as Germany and Sweden. While the EU Commission has prohibited any funding 
to external border barriers. Um, despite a growing amount of member states pleading for that funding to take place. And the EU Commission has told Finland that um, Finland under EU law cannot shut its borders in the face of hybrid warfare from a country such as Russia, um, mm. you know, with weaponization of migration and so on, just like Belarus and Turkey did. Uh, no, that would be illegal. Um, yeah, and like, they tell uh, Lithuania uh, the same Lithuania. thing, basically. Yes. Yeah? yeah, Lithuania was just condemned by the European Court of Justice yeah. uh, for pushing back migrants, um, yeah, which is a weird interpretation of the law because um, it's, it's, uh, if you push back migrants, let's say, from a war zone, if Poland would push people back to Ukraine, I could see the logic, but I mean, these are people that voluntarily go to Belarus, which is a dictatorship, but it's stable. I mean, they voluntarily go there. So, I mean, I don't see why under the rules uh, you should not be allowed to push them back. Uh, but, but anyway, the Court of Justice had a different opinion and now Lithuania has pledged not to, um, you know, respect the ruling, which of course is, is problematic in itself, right? But um, yeah, maybe um, a result of um, problematic rules, I, I don't know, that judges interpret in a weird way or... What's your what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I think we need to um, update the rules. They are not uh, in line with the times at all. Uh, and um, Russia, Belarus, Turkey, uh, Morocco, uh, they have all identified this weakness of the European Union that uh, um, even though there is uh, a reasonable... Um, uh, degree of suspicion that migrants coming towards the border are not indeed indeed not asylum seekers refugee, refugees but rather economic migrants mm. we must process their asylum applications they know this um, mm. and and uh, Lithuania realized that uh, these rules need need to be changed and uh, also um, more than 10, I think 12 member states have demanded that uh, the EU revise its uh, um, legislation on um, pushbacks. That's a that's not a legal term. It's a political term, but yeah. actually opening up for to open up for for uh, pushbacks in reality. And I think that is that is something that need to happen because otherwise, uh, with not not least taking this migrate coming migration pressure in into account uh, it, it, the situation will be unsustainable um, and then adding to uh, the problems is the development uh, developments within Frontex where the um, uh, director general uh, Fabrice Leguerri uh, he resigned uh, after basically a coup within that organization where uh, the management board of Frontex told him that um, he was to consider recommendations from human rights officers, so-called politrucs, I think they called them within the Red Army, um, and uh, human rights officers and NGOs to accept those recommendations as orders. And, you know, one of those recommendations during the hybrid warfare by Belarus against Lithuania and Poland was that Frontex um, rent buses to drive those Iraqis who came from the uh, most often uh, Kurdish region, a KRG mm -hmm. in Iraq, quite peaceful there. I've been there five times um, to bust them into EU territory. He refused. And uh, he, well, he had to pray, pay a price for standing up for the principle that the mandate of Frontex is to enable, to, to help uh, aid uh, member states uh, protecting their borders. So this is where we are now, uh, this, that they want a same, the same kind of structure as, as you saw in the Red Army. You had military commanders, but then you had the commissar who could trump the military commander any time. And that's yeah. the role of the human rights officers in the mindset of uh, uh, of those who, um, uh, well, decide things in Brussels. That's extremely worrying.
Very worrying, very worrying. And uh, it's good that at least um, that, that you are challenging this uh, openly. So uh, um, now let's move to, to, um, to another topic, uh, which is um, um, EU funding for uh, Islamist uh, groups. Yeah. Uh, so of course, it's, it's one thing that, um, you know, people have, a, let's say, a rather authoritarian uh, view on things. I mean, that's, this is, of course, um, uh, to be regretted and that people um, adhere to all kinds of obscure religions or interpretations of religions. Um, and, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think in a free society, you can only solve this on the long term. But the, the one thing I think we can do, um, and, and what the one thing the European Union can do as a as a policy, uh, uh, you know, um, as a policy level, is is not to 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 um, to subsidize uh, hate groups uh, and to subsidize uh, what I would call uh, Islamo-fascist um, um, uh, groups. So, so I've seen that you've done some important work on that, on alerting uh, not only the European Union institutions, but also the French government uh, of how the EU is actually playing not a small role in financially supporting uh, groups that are uh, separatist, you know, for, that are calling for apartheid, really. Um, and um, it's just incredible that this has not even received more attention, right? That the European Union is engaged in this? It is incredible. Um, and I, I think it has to do with the fact that um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the media, mainstream media, a lot of mainstream politicians, they cannot separate between um, Muslims in general and those who uh, are organized um, Islamic extremists. Mm. They, they are not uh, able to see what is uh, actually entity, an entity connected to or associated with the ideas and the milieu of uh, an organization such as the Muslim Brotherhood. They, they do not comprehend this. Um, in Sweden, you see even center-right parties granting money to an organization such as Ibn Rushd with very clear links to the Muslim Brotherhood. So mm. when I came to Brussels, I I just took for granted that what I saw in Sweden uh, of this public financing also took place in Brussels. Uh, and um, I uh, let two scholars have a look at it, and they found out that, yes, indeed, um, Organizations such as the Islamic Relief, uh, for instance, have received massive funding from, from the EU. And at first, uh, the Commission didn't want to admit it, but uh, faced with the facts and faced with um, the um, attention of the French government, which I alerted here in uh, the Libe Committee in the European Parliament uh, during our uh, exchanges of views, the Commission has now uh, vowed to to actually do something about the problem, and um, uh, so, so so there is an emerging um, realization that not only is um, Salafi jihadism the violent version of Islamic extremism, but also non-violent extremism a problem. I mean, um, jihadism poses a grave security threat, and we uh, know that here in Brussels, not at least. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the nonviolent uh, Islamism poses a systemic threat to Europe because, as you said, it wants to um, create a par parallel structure to uh, make... Uh, basically Western Europe into something akin to what we see in Lebanon with uh, parallel legislation for Christians, Sunnis, and Shiites. Um, this, is, this is something that uh, uh, we, need to, um, we need to fight. Um, I mean, we are used to fight ideas. Why don't we fight these ideas? We, we should not fund it. And we should not legitimize it because this is something that the EU does as well while yes. receiving the, the youth organization, FEMISO, 
uh, at the commission, uh, Commissioner Dolly uh, did that. Mm -hmm. They are given, you know, uh, given the floor at the European Youth Forum and naive uh, youngsters from all across the uh, all across the European Union are basically s standing up and giving ovations to these these guys. Um, this is a huge problem. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to I'm not going to. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sleep until I, I, I've uh, actually ended this funding. Very good, very good. Then um, in September, correct me if I'm wrong, we're having uh, elections in Sweden. Um, so maybe um, to, as the last topic, could you, could you tell us a little bit um, about that? What do you expect? Um, I mean, what, is the, uh, what, what are the, the priorities uh, for your party? Well, on the one side, you have the uh, governing coalition now, uh, headed by the Social Democrats with the Greens, the Center Party, which is in Renew, a left liberal party, uh, and you have the former uh, Communist Party, the left party. Uh, that's the red-green side. On the other side, you have the blue and yellow side, or the conservative side, uh, with two EPP parties, uh, the Moderates and the Christian Democrats, uh, us as the ECR party and actually a renewed party as well, the Liberal Party, which uh, actually switched from the other side. Um, they were facing extinction, so I guess they had to, uh, but uh, uh, because their voters are leaning more to the right. So um, the priorities are, um, well, number one, I would say uh, fighting crime. Um, there's a crime epidemic in Sweden, um, which is uh, very, uh, very strongly connected with immigration. You see mm -hmm. criminal clans uh, dominating the suburbs of Gothenburg, actually even uh, establishing uh, checkpoints to their area um, to, oh. to check all cars passing. Uh, so there goes the... the Monopoly on uh, of violence uh, for the state, right? Um, okay, these checkpoints were temporary, but it's a show force that should scare uh, the voters. Um, yeah. You have um, the Bild Zeitung um, naming Sweden the most dangerous country in Europe because of all of the shootings. Uh, one shooting a day in general uh, and, and uh, one bombing a week. Um, and... Um, I think um, you also see a very disconcerting uh, development in these areas that are um, ridden with criminality that they are now starting to um, influence the administrations. Uh, so um, uh, try basically trying to control economic decisions in, in these municipalities and so on and so forth. So. Uh, there's a corruption uh, to it that is uh, spreading, not like wildfire yet, but um, the problem is when it has established itself, uh, it's very hard to get rid of. Just ask the Italians. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is extremely worrying. So, so um, fighting crime, um, um, we are uh, we agree on our side that uh, the the that immigration should be on the lowest level in the EU. Um, and of course, the migration pact proposed by Ulva Johansson will be a big thing. Unfortunately, the other parties do not realize that this is setting a precedent in which where uh, the EU will decide on uh, migration volumes. Um, and, and we, us not being able to freely implement our migration policies as we uh, always uh, have been so. This is this is not yet resolved, and I I hope that I'll be able to raise this issue um, so that also the EPP parties say no. Uh, inflation is a a um, big issue as well, and energy prices, um, nuclear. Um, the the current government shut down uh, several. Uh, reactors and uh, the Swedes are paying the price for that now and we're looking into these smaller reactors to try to uh, 
build those in a short period of time. And I think it has been a discussion on on, on nuclear power. Well, um, is it possible to reopen these nuclear plants? I think it's going to be hard to do that, okay. uh, technically, unfortunately. Um, but uh, so these small reactors is a way out. But I personally think that we're talking about, uh, I mean, I'm... I'm free market, but I view, I regard um, energy as a core state um, competence. Uh, if we cannot provide energy in our country, uh, the country yeah. will not function. So mm. uh, just to leave it to, you know, leave it to the market to, to build new large nuclear reactors, mm. that's maybe not the way forward. Maybe we would have to regard this from a national security viewpoint um, mm. and um, invest in this uh, because we know from the past that in the future it will secure stability, will it will pay off. Um, so because no um, actor on the market is really interested right now to build anything because the insurance costs are mm. just sky high. So why would they risk uh, entering into such a venture. Um, so the regulatory, so standards, we need to look at. the regulatory standards are very hostile to, um, to these new, uh, new kinds of uh, nuclear reactors. So Intentionally so, yes. yes. Exactly. Um, so these are, these are uh, parts of the issues that uh, we debate in Sweden right now. And I think... Uh, th there's a 50-50 chance right now that uh, there will be change of gov government. Uh, right. I heard just this morning that energy prices are very much on the rise. And uh, I think it will be hard for the government to explain how they will um, be a responsible uh, actor in this uh, when they have to base their rule on the Green Party. Uh, because even though the Green Party in Germany has its problems, uh, the the Swedish Greens are much more fundis than than the German Green Party. Uh, right. It's a small extremist party, and uh, they are ready to sacrifice uh, Swedish energy independence uh, to uh, um, signal a virtue. So uh, this is uh, going to be a big and important talking point for us uh, in this debate. All right. Well, um, fascinating. And uh, we, of course, we, we look forward to, um, to, to these elections. Um, we will continue to follow uh, your work in the European Parliament, Charlie. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, this great discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. The Brussels Report Podcast.